Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. We welcome every one of you. We do have visitors, always glad to have visitors with us in our services. We're glad you're here. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We hope you doing the hour coming up. We can be an inspiration to multitudes out in the radio listening audience as well as you here in the auditorium. And you out in the radio listening audience, if you'd get on your phone and call a friend, especially shut in, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. I believe we can be a blessing to them. We'll be doing them favor. Be doing us a favor as well. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 16. And my Bible is page 1098. While you're turning there, I'd like to say to you in the radio listening audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune to the station while you're listening, while you're, while you're now listening, then you can get the broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday. I trust you'll do that if you're not doing it already. And if you'd like to have some of our cassette tape, if you're right in and request a list, we'll send you a list of our tape. We have about a hundred and about 198 listed here. And we send these tape out for a gift of $3 each. And the gift is yours. Help take care of our radio expense. And we'd be glad to send you some of these tape. Now tape today will be tape number 199. 199 is the tape today. Both the music and the message will be on tape. We tape our Sunday morning broadcast every Sunday. And this will be tape number 199. Now I'm speaking today on this subject, some things in hell that ought to be in every Baptist church. That's what I'm speaking on today. And we'll send them out. You can call, write in for them by number or by title. I'll be glad to get them in the mail to you. And then if you'd like to have a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour, we'd be delighted to send you one of our brochures. You know, you may say, Preacher Edwards, it'd be several months yet before you'd be going, but now's the time to get your name on the list. Last year, we had about four of us preachers working together, and we had 51, and some of them almost got left out last year because they waited almost too late. And so get your name on the list for our tour of next year. It'll be in March, on March the 10th, a 10-day tour to Israel. And while in Israel, we'll visit Masada. We'll visit uh, Mount Hermon. We'll ride on the Sea of Galilee. We'll go to the Garden Tomb. We'll visit Mount Calvary. We'll go to the Upper Room. We'll visit David's Tomb. And when, then when we leave Israel, we go to Rome. We'll visit the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Paul's Prison, where he spent his last days. Probably the Catacombs, where many... Christians were buried, and other places that I won't have time to mention. It's a trip of a lifetime. Write in and request the brochure. I may be speaking to someone your pastor's never been. Well, one of the greatest things you could do for your pastor or your pastor and his wife would be to send them to the Holy Land. They'll come back all fired up, and they'll be a blessing to you, and I'll always appreciate it. I've been there 12 times, and I get excited and thrilled thinking about going back again. You always see something new and learn something new every time you go. Then just to take people that's never been and some that's been maybe once or twice, it's a real thrill to our hearts. We'd like for you to be concerned about it. Turn to Luke 16. I'll begin reading in just a moment in the familiar passage. My preaching is not quite like the preacher that had his sermon all written out. And uh, the dog got a hold of it and kind of tore it up. Only let him, left about 10% of his message. He came to the pulpit. He told the people, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I'll be only be able to preach to you about 10% of my usual time that I preach. Dog got a hold of my sermon and tore it all up with 10% of it. So he went ahead and preached his 10%. And after service, a lady came down. She said, uh, preacher said, uh, was that dog a male or a female? He said, well, it was a female. She said, I'm glad. He said, when she has some puppies, I want one of them to give to my pastor. 
Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. Now was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed substantially every day. Now was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Move the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seen Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fix. So they which would pass from hence, you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that I would send him to my father's house. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's reading from Luke chapter 16, verse 2, that this is a parable. It's not a parable. It actually happened. And nowhere in the Bible you find where Jesus ever gave a person's name in a parable. Jesus told about something that actually came to pass. And this is not a parable. You cannot explain away hell. You have a lot of people, they trying to do so, but you cannot. Hell is an established fact. Hell is a place where people go that die without God. There's only two destinations after this life. One is heaven. The other is hell. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a lie. If any man should come along deny either one of these, he's a liar, according to the Bible. Now, hell is a place to shun. Hell is a place to gain. And you go to heaven by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. You go to hell by failing to get saved. And that you need to keep in mind. But I'm going to speak about some things in hell that should be in every Baptist church. Number one, they have a vision in hell. The Bible says in verse 23, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Down there they have a vision of doing things for God, but they can't get them accomplished. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, Where there is no vision, the people perish. On this earth, God's people very seldom ever get a strong vision of lost people enough to do anything about it. But down in hell, they have that vision. They can do nothing about it. Jesus said, look on the fields. They are now white under harvest and the labors are few. We need to get a vision in our Baptist churches today and try to get people saved. The average church today has lost its vision and not concerned about lost humanity anymore. That's why we have so few people saved in our churches today. Now, you could put on a big religious carnival and draw a big crowd, but that's not worth a dime with a hole in it. After the crowd is gone, the carnival is over, then you have nothing left. We need to preach the gospel. We need to witness. We need to pray and get people saved. So they have a vision in hell. Secondly, down in hell, they have tears down there, and we need more tears in our Baptist churches today. There used to be a time when you see many people weeping doing a gospel message, and you hear many amens and many people praising God. You don't hear much of that anymore. We need more tears in our churches. In verse 24, the Bible said he cried. He wept down in hell. We need those tears today. In Psalms chapter 126 and verse 6, He that goeth forth weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Some of the greatest soul winners in the world today have won souls to God with tears in their eyes. I can name some preachers today, some two or three, that never came to the pulpit unless they wept during their entire message. 
Would to God we had more tears today. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. When he preached, he wept. Now, I'm not talking about little crocodile tears pumped up by human effort. I'm talking about genuine tears that come from a heart that's heavy and burdened about lost people. We need to pray to God to give us more tears. We need to do more weeping over the lost and over this lost and ungodly world. We need more tears today in the average Baptist church. The land is filled with sin. People are dying every day. People are going to hell every day. Young people committing suicide. People dying with terrible disease. News meters playing them up as great and wonderful and good and kind people. Never telling you why they died and how they contracted the terrible disease. Like a case that happened here recently. A person very popular in the land died and his body was cremated, poured out over the ocean. The news media played him to high heaven, talking about how wonderful he was. Such a good man, such a nice man, such a kind man. I'm not trying to gate that in any manner. He may have been. But what they did not do and what they should have done is told the American people how he contracted those diseases and why he contracted the disease called AIDS that took him out of the world. They didn't mention that. It's common knowledge as to why he contracted that disease. People, many of them know it. But the people of the world needs to know it. And the news media is going to play up an individual like that, then tell why he died, why he had the disease. And he had the disease because of the kind of person he was and his lifestyle that he practiced for many, many years. And that's terrible. And many of them on the same track today and on the same road. And the news media had told people that might have scared some of them off that's headed in that direction that they might go not go the same route. Well, so much for that. Now, there's tears in hell. There ought to be tears in every Baptist church. Number three, they were concerned for service down there. In verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, they wanted some service done down there. We need to be concerned about service here in our churches. The Bible speaks about serving God, serving each other. That's much to be done. He said, send Lazarus. Let him just dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. Now, he wanted to be served. He wanted to be served with mercy. He said, have mercy on me. I want to be served down here with mercy. They believe in service down in hell, but there's nothing they can do about it as far as this earth is concerned. On this earth... We are not concerned very much about service. That's church members today on this beautiful Lord's Day. And you couldn't ask for any more beautiful day to be in God's house. And every true born again believer should be in a good true Bible believing church worshiping God. But there's some right now listening to the sound of my voice. You know you ought to be in God's house. You know you're too lazy to get up and come to God's house. You know you're backslid on God and that's bad. It's bad, beloved, unless a person is sick or providentially hindered. You shouldn't be away from God's house on a beautiful day like this. You need to be concerned about the service of the Lord. Then number four, down in hell they have fire. They have flame down there. In verse 24, I'm tormented in this flame. Now what we need today in the average Baptist church is some good old Holy Ghost fire. Some fire of God in our churches. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost in flames of fire, tongues of fire. And I'm talking about spiritual fire today, not literal fire in our church. I'm talking about getting on fire for God. Down in hell they have fire down there, literal fire. And they would like to get on fire for God but cannot. If God would say to the inmates in hell... I'm going to let you out of hell and let you come back to the earth, get on fire for God, go around so winning. In a matter of 10 seconds, it wouldn't be an inmate left in hell. Every last one of them would be on this earth, going from door to door, from city to city, trying to get people saved to keep them out of hell. Down there, they have fire. We need fire in our church. We need to get fired up to the glory of God. And God wants us to be on fire for him. So they have fire in hell. We need it in our churches today. Number five, they have their memory down in hell. In verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. 
Now, when a person dies and goes to hell, he doesn't go down there to go to sleep. He doesn't go down there to forget things. He remembers everything that he ever did on this earth down in hell. He remembers every time he had an opportunity to get saved. He remembered every time that he should have done something for God or got right with God rather and did not. He remembered the time when the preacher tried to get him to Jesus. He remembers the time when his mother prayed for him and tried to get him to come to God. You remember all things down in hell if you die without God. You remember the time you passed by the church and knew you could have gone in and heard the gospel and been saved. You remember all of these things down in hell and that's terrible. If a person could go to hell and leave his memory elsewhere, he could rest a little better. But when you go to hell, that's going to be remorse. You remember, you met, your mind will be there. You remember these things. Your faculty of remembrance will be there. And you'll remember all things that you did upon the earth. And especially every time you had a chance to get saved and you did not. You'll remember the churches uh, when you passed by and you failed to see the churches. Uh, you remember these things. And so you go and remember these things down in hell. Uh, brother, would you answer the phone for me? Thank you. Down in hell, remember these things. Uh, the people remember them down there. And they, they can do nothing about it. They carry their memory with them. And so down there, you cannot uh, do away with that memory. You cannot drown it out. You must remember that down there, that memory stays with you until you come to the judgment bar of God and cast into the lake of fire. And you'll probably carry your memory right on with you then. So down in hell, that's strong, strong memory. And then uh, number six, down in hell, there's a prayer meeting going on. Now you talk about an old-fashioned prayer meeting. Down in hell, there's a prayer meeting taking place like you never heard of before, but it's, in, it, it's of no avail. The Bible says in verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that I would send him to my father's house. He's praying that I pray thee therefore, Father, that I would send him to my father's house. So he's praying down in hell that somebody would go to his father's house and warn his brothers. Now, there's a time coming when people are going to pray, but it'll be too late. In the book of Revelation, whenever God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, the Bible said they prayed for the rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne, but they prayed too late. Down in hell, they're praying, they're pleading, they're begging. He said, I pray thee therefore, Father Abraham, I want somebody to go to my father's house. Now, if you notice here, he mentioned his five brothers. He was concerned about his five brothers, but not one time did he mention his mother and dad. He mentioned the house, the old home place where the brothers lived evidently, but he didn't mention his father and mother. I believe the reason he did not mention his father and mother is because they were down there with him. Now, I believe if that had been a man and woman that loved God on fire for God and serving God, I believe they could at least reach one of these six boys for God. I believe that at least one, one of them to God, if not all of them. But here you have six brothers, all of them lost, on the road to hell. Evidently their mother and dad did not know God, died without God, went to hell, and left these poor boys lost on the earth. And then one of them dies and goes to hell, and he's praying down there for someone to go back and warn his five brothers. And then number seven, people down in hell are concerned about lost loved ones. Now we need that in our church today. We just move along in kind of a haphazard kind of a way many times, cold and indifferent, unconcerned about our lost loved ones. It really don't dawn on us like it should that our loved ones will go to a place called hell and be tormented forever and forever, never a chance to get saved. Now we that are saved will go to heaven, but that our loved ones is lost. We need to be more concerned about them. They're going to hell. I don't care how much you love your earthly brother or your earthly sister or your mother or your dad or your children. If they don't get saved, they are going to hell. Your salvation and your concern is not going to get them to heaven. They've got to be one to God. They are going to die and in hell they'll be screaming, weeping and wailing. They're in the flames, the regions of the damned. And if you have lost children, 
you have a lost brother, a lost sister, a mother, a dad, they may go there. If somebody don't win them to God, they will go there. They'll go to hell where they'll never be able to get out and get saved. That's all. That ought to stir us up enough to cause us to want to go out and win our loved ones to God. We need to do that. Keep praying. Keep talking. Keep working. Don't give up. I know that some of your loved ones are the hardest people you'll ever witness to. The Bible said about Jesus in his day, even his brethren didn't believe in him. Jesus grew up in his home there in Nazareth along with his brothers and sisters that were born to Mary and Joseph after his birth. And they didn't even believe him until after the death, burial, and resurrection. And some of your kin folks are the hardest people in the world to witness to. Now, when you first get saved, you'll find some of them to be the easiest people you ever want to God. And then after you win them, you're going to find the rest of them will be the hardest people you've ever witnessed to and ever tried to get to God. And if somebody don't win them to God, they're going to hell as certain as you listen to me today. Hell's an awful place. We need to be concerned about our lost loved ones. Down in hell, in verses 27 and 28, that thou shouldest send him to my father's house. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. He said, I got five lost brothers on the earth. Somebody needs to win them to God. I want somebody to win them to God. Because if they don't get saved, they're coming to hell. And he didn't want them down there. He didn't want to lay his eyes on them again. Because he knew if he ever saw them again, it'd be in the regions of the damned. And he didn't want them down there. He's concerned about them. So we need to be concerned about our lost loved ones. Number eight, down in hell they have testimonies and witnessing down there. In verse 28, he said that he may testify unto them. Now, Paul left to give his testimony. Paul said, I'd do anything I, if I could just win my people to God. Paul testified everywhere he went about Jesus and salvation. Down in hell, they're testifying. He said, I want my brother saved. I want somebody to testify to my brothering. I want somebody to testify to my lost loved ones. I want someone to tell them about Jesus. Every lost soul in hell today is down there wishing, hoping, praying. Oh, I wish, I hope that somebody will go and win my brother or my mother, or my father, or my sister, or my children to God. I don't want them to come down here. And they're disturbed about all oh, that they said, maybe the preacher will go. Maybe some of the deacons will go. Maybe the Sunday school teacher will go. Maybe somebody in the church will go and warn my people, warn my lost lovers because they're coming down here if they're not saved. And I don't want them down here. Oh, they're stirred up in hell. They're testifying in hell. They don't want people to come down there. It's an awful, awful place. If we could just get one glimpse of hell today, we'd never be the same again. If hell could open up and let out the inmates. Now you're talking about people traveling from house to house and people just won't let others alone tell them about God. They'd be doing that. And so they're lost down there and on the road to hell. Number nine, we need to know that people are lost are on the road to hell. Verse 28, if I have five brethren that he may testify unless they also come into this place of torment. You know, it never dawns on us that we have lost loved ones and friends on the road to hell. When you leave this church today and you see your loved one, your brother, or your sister, or some of your close relatives, I want you to think about this. You're on the road to hell. You're on the road to hell. You may not want to tell them. might be good if you did. But I want you to think about it. You're on the road to hell. While you may be in hell tomorrow at this time, you're going toward hell. You're headed toward hell. A lot of people are getting older. Some of you have parents. It's not safe. Getting up in years. They're on the road to hell. And the older they become, less out they'll ever be saved. You need to look at them and look them in the face and say, he's on the road to hell. That's my mother. That's my daddy. That's my brother. That's my sister. He's on the road to hell. She's on the road to hell. That's my child. He's on the road to hell. She's on the road to hell. They're going to hell if they don't get saved. Oh, you need to realize that. To know that people are lost are on the road to hell. He said, I got five brothers. They're headed down the road to hell. And I want somebody to head them off. Number 10. Uh, there's belief in repentance down in hell. And that ought to be in every Baptist church in this country. 
The Bible says in verse 30, and he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went of them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 30. Now you're talking about people believing in repentance. People in hell believe in repentance. Down here in this little liberal, modernistic, social gospel type preaching today that you hear across America, you don't hear anything about repentance. All you hear about is making decisions. Uh, trying to turn over a new leaf. I'll join the church. I'll try to do better. Assign the card. You don't hear a preacher saying you need to repent or you're going to hell. Beloved, repentance is something that you must do if you expect to be saved. That word repentance is, means that you're sorry for your sins. You're willing to turn your backs up on your sins and believe on Jesus Christ. We need to preach repentance. This little easy believism today and making decisions uh, is not the genuine. Those people are still on the road to hell. I can name some outstanding people in the world today as far as the world knowledge is concerned that made decisions and uh, outliving like the devil and call themselves uh, uh, Christians that know nothing about God. That little decision making easy believism is filling our churches full of people and, and filling hell up today without them knowing anything about God. You are not going to get saved unless you repent and sorry for your sins. And we need to turn your back upon your sins and accept Jesus Christ. We need more repentance preached today, and they believed in that in hell. And every Baptist church needs more preaching on repentance and more talking about repentance. And then number six, there's life down in hell. In verse, uh, in one of the verses, said in hell, lift up his eyes, been in torments, and Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now they have life down there. They are dead down there. Dives looked across that gulf and he saw. Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. There's life in hell. And we need more life in our churches today. Many of our churches are as dead as can be. We need more spiritual life in our churches. Many of them are dead. And, and uh, at 12 o'clock noon or whenever they miss the, miss the service, then of course it's time for the dead to rise and go home. We need more people that's alive today and serving God on fire for God has some life. Has some life about the things of God. A lot of people sit around the church like a wooden Indian. Bat the eyes like a frog in a hailstorm. And wonder what the preacher is talking about. And when they get on the outside, sound like a gang of walking birds. Beloved, listen, we need some life in our churches. We need some people that say amen once in a while. Some people that say praise God once in a while. Some people that say hallelujah once in a while. Glory to God once in a while. We need life in our churches and not sit around half dead and half asleep and wonder when the preacher is going to uh, get through so we can go home. Got your mind on what you got cooking in the kitchen or something like that. We need life in our churches. They had life in hell. There's life down there now. And we need life in our churches. Then finally, hell is a reality. Now we need that in our churches today. Verse 23, in hell, he lift up his eyes. The Bible didn't say the man lift up his eyes in the graveyard. Now you have a cult in the land today, uh, the Russellite movement and uh, Seventh-day Adventists and the Russellites are the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, which they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, they're devil's witnesses. True people of God are Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah means God and they most certainly are not God's witness and they don't believe in hell and, and they, they think uh, you go to the grave, you don't know anything. But the Bible didn't say the man opened his eyes in the graveyard. The Bible said the man opened his eyes in hell. Now you need to realize that hell is an actual place. Hell is a place where people go. Hell is a place where people go that do not know God. There's no other place God can carry you. If you die without Jesus Christ, God can't take you to heaven. God can't let one person to heaven that dies without Jesus Christ in his heart. If he did, every inmate in hell would raise up, point his finger toward God and say, you're an unjust God. You put me down here and you let one go without getting saved. God's not going to do it. God's a just God. Every man that dies without God's going to hell. I don't care who he is. How good he may be, how kind he may act, he's going to hell. And the beloved down in hell today, it's a madhouse. It tells us in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, that hell is a madhouse. Now you talk about cussing, and you talk about accusations, and you're talking about pointing fingers, and you're talking about people cussing one another out. There's children down there cussing their parents. That's brothers cussing brothers. 
as people are cussing preachers that are down there and people cussing priests and nuns and rabbis and ministers and, and religious leaders all over the world down there cussing them because they told them lies and didn't tell them how to be saved and try to win them to God and they died and went to hell with them and you talking about cussing? Why some of those people not every time they look at some old apostate priest or rabbi or nun or a minister or some religious leader that let them die and go to hell without telling them how to be saved. They cuss them. They cuss them every time they meet them. Hell's a mad house. Old apostate preachers, that liberal men that never preach the gospel and preach a little social gospel and, and let people die and go to hell. The people he preached to is going to point their finger in his face and cuss him while he's down there and say, you low down dirty devil. You supposed to have been a preacher and told me how to be saved and you let me die and go to hell. I'd hate to be in that madhouse. By the grace of God, I don't intend to be in that madhouse. Now, if you want to go on to hell and join that crowd, it's up to you. God's not going to force you to get saved. God's not going to make you get saved, but God will gladly save you if you want to be saved. If you don't want to be saved, God lets you die and go to hell. He's done all he's going to do to keep you out by giving his son on the cross. Now, it's up to you. You can get saved and go to heaven when you die, or you can just sit back and know God and die and go to hell. It's entirely up to the individual. Thank you. You listen well. Let's stand our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it and speak to hearts in this auditorium. Then, dear Father, I pray that you'll speak to somebody in the radio listen audience today that's near eternity without God. Father, save somebody out there today that's very, very close to going to hell. God, use the message Oh, God, speak to hearts. Have your way in this invitation. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David's going to play on the organ in just a moment as she plays softly on the instrument. If you're here unsaved and you want to get saved, would you come down here? Let me help you to the Lord. If you're here backslidden on God, you want to come back to God, would you come down here? Let me help you back to the Lord. If you're here and you don't have a good fundamental Bible-believing church home like Northside, and you'd like for this church to be your church home, would you come and join up with us today? How about it while we play? Amen. God bless you. This morning, this young lady came and said she'd been saved and she wants to join this church and be baptized. The dear brother said he had been saved and he wanted to transfer his church letter. Maybe somebody else. God is moving on you to join Northside today. Would you come? That's all I ask you to do is just obey the Lord. Whatever he tells you to do, you obey the Lord. Would you do it? While we wait. Hell's an awful place. A man in England some time ago said if he believed in God and believed in hell like Christians said they did, he wouldn't sleep at night hardly. He said he'd be going house to house day and night, pleading, crying, begging people to get saved. See, the devil puts you to sleep and try to get you to forget about hell. That's what he wants to do. He wants you to get people saved. 